So as many of you might know, the What Working Group and the W3C are both working together on HTML. Um, they're, so they're working together, but uh, they share two different models of uh, operating. Um, the What Working Group spec is actually a superset of the W3C spec, uh, which limits itself to only stuff that is in the HTML5, uh, whereas the What Working Group spec includes some additional features, uh, like uh, the 2D context, uh, the web workers, and stuff like that. Uh, or, um, so the, the What Working Group uh, spec is a living standard, so it's going to uh, continually evolve with new features as they're needed, as they're requested uh, and developed by the community. Um, whereas the W3C spec will uh, go through a f stage of a feature freeze, which uh, is needed before the last call, which is coming up soon. So that means that no new features will get added to the HTML5 spec itself within the W3C, even though some new features may start being developed within the What Working Group spec. Uh, so next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the W3C is moving to last call soon. So I'm just going to cover what that actually means uh, for web developers and users uh, and who it really affects. Um, so what it means is pretty much nothing for web developers. Uh, it's a formal process within the W3C uh, where the spec uh, reaches feature freeze and they intend it uh, for getting a wider review of the features that it already documents. Um, so that basically so they can uh, start tidying up the loose ends of what's in there rather than adding in uh, new features. Uh, but uh, as I said, new features are still going to be uh, introduced in the What Working Group spec or in other separate specs within the W3C. Uh, so it doesn't really have too much effect there. Um, it doesn't really have much effect on implementers either since we always follow whatever the latest version spe specification is. It's really only a formal process issue within the W3C. Um, but they will use that uh, to, they need to resolve the remaining open issues before they can actually move to last call, which I'm going to cover in the next slide. So uh, the two major open issues at the moment are the age group element and the long desk attribute. So the edge group element is a proposed feature for marking up uh, headings with subtitles. Uh, so that's like when you, you have a main heading and then just uh, some short descriptive subtitle below that. Uh, and there's been some uh, concern expressed over the complexity of the edge group element uh, and claims that it causes confusion amongst web developers. Uh, the counter argument is that it actually follows the the pattern that is widely used among web pages these days already, mostly using the div element and h1 and h2 elements, uh, or h1 and p elements. Um, so yeah, there's a debate going on right now. Uh, try and figure out which approach we should take, whether we should stick with the h group element as currently defined, or whether we should drop it uh, and come up with a, a new approach sometime in the future. Uh, the other issue is a long desk attribute, which some of you might know is used to provide long descriptions uh, for images, uh, basically intended to describe an image to someone who can't see the image, uh, typically someone who is blind. Uh, this debate has been going on for a number of years, pretty much uh, since 2007 when the uh, What Working Group joined with the W3C on HTML5. And the argument is that the long def attribute doesn't actually solve uh, what it's intended to solve. And over the past 15 years or whatever, it's been so misused and abused that it's not really not worth saving. Um, the arguments from its proponents is that it actually does uh, provide some small uh, uh, solution to a use case, but uh, it's not clear whether it really does address it. Um, so that argument is ongoing. The issue did actually get formally resolved uh, a year or two ago. Uh, there was a formal working group decision which said that no, we're not going to include it, you're going to drop it. Uh, and then the proponents uh, put together a new uh, document arguing for its inclusion and got the issue reopened. So now it's come back again and we're going to go through a whole the whole debate again. 
Okay, next slide. So some of the features that uh, are in HTML5 and are being implemented, I'm just going to go through some of those now, starting with video and audio. Uh, I'm sure many of you will already be aware of some of the features and the fact that there is a format war at the moment, mostly between WebM and MPEG-4. Uh, that format war is still ongoing and there's no end in sight just yet, although WebM has gained some advantages with Chrome and Opera and Firefox having support and in IE with a third-party plugin, uh, but MPEG-4 is still holding on since it's needed for Safari. Um, but uh, there are some proposals to extend the, the feature set for video and audio. Uh, first and foremost is the full screen API proposals. Uh, this uh, initially started with a proposal from WebKit a while ago, uh, which only allowed for the video element itself to be uh, put into full screen mode. There was an API to request full screen and ask permission for the user and say, so the user could say yes or no. Uh, but it was limited to just the video. You could, there was no chance of being able to overlay any other content like canvas elements or other dynamic content you wanted to do with the DOM. Uh, more recently, uh, Mozilla team have put together a more complex proposal which basically allows you to go into full screen mode for the whole document. Uh, this allows you to put either the video in full screen and you can overlay that with canvas elements to do dynamic drawing or you can put other images or whatever content over the top um, and there's uh, various APIs in there to say whether you want keyboard uh, control or whether you just want a non-interactive full screen display um, and they're trying to address all the security concerns with that to making sure it's as secure as possible without limiting developers too much. Uh, on the accessibility front, uh, there are new features for uh, subtitles and captions, also descriptions and uh, chapter markers uh, being added. There's a new track element that's currently in the specification. Uh, so it's been proposed to basically address the accessibility issues uh, and allows you to embed a what's called a web SRT file, uh, or link to it rather. Uh, so that's based on the, the very common SRT format that's supported by players like VLC and other uh, players. Uh, so it's a sort of a modified version of that that allows uh, for limited HTML markup with inside it. You can, you can put the uh, bold and italic elements and I think there's some coloring available as well. Uh, but it's mostly just text with timestamps. Uh, so that format is used for all of the, the text tracks, whether subtitles, captions, audio descriptions, or, uh, chapter top markers or whatever. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the next useful feature is Canvas. So this has been around for quite a while and many will probably be aware of the, the 2D context that this allows you to draw 2D images. And uh, WebGL is a relatively new uh, context that's been defined. Um, it's actually been defined outside of the W3C and the World Working Group by the, the Kronos group who uh, developed the OpenGL specification. Uh, so WebGL allows you to draw images in a 3D context. Um, so you can do fancy graphics like you get in 3D computer games and stuff like that. Um, it is largely based on the OpenGL ES specification. So the shaders themselves are written in the GLES shading language rather than JavaScript. Uh, so it does mean if you want to learn, if you want to learn and write WebGL, you actually have to learn a separate language. And then you, there's JavaScript APIs that allow you to uh, you get the, the shader language uh, as a text string and you uh, call an API that, that inserts that, or it compiles that shader uh, in the graphics card or whatever supports OpenGL on your system. So that's been implemented in uh, Firefox 4, Chrome, uh, and WebKit, and Opera has recently released a labs build with the support for that, or preliminary support at least. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, user media uh, basically refers to webcams and microphones. Uh, so 
the idea is that you can on a web page you can request access to the user's camera and microphone so you can for example uh, record a short video clip and upload that as a file or you can do direct P2P streaming uh, between users um, there was an initial implementation of that for just the, the webcam implemented in a preview on Opera uh, on Android devices that was released uh, about a month ago um, so it allows you to uh, you say get user media and you tell it whether you want video or audio or both and it will prompt the user uh, uh, the user can uh, allow access uh, so then it gives you a stream object and then you can either output that stream to a video element just to so you can show the user what they're seeing and um, there's proposals uh, being developed now so you can then stream that video or audio uh, over a peer-to-peer -peer connection uh, and there's uh, other APIs that, so that you can actually record a video clip and save it as a file or a blob rather and then upload that to a web server so like YouTube could for example uh, implement a, sh a video recording system in HTML5 uh, with these APIs whereas they currently do that with Flash or some websites do that with Flash right now Okay, the next slide, please. So uh, the HTML5 parser is the last feature I'm going to discuss. Uh, it doesn't mean too much for web developers, although it does provide uh, consistent handling among browsers. Previously, uh, especially for error handling, uh, web browsers implemented their own um, error recovery, basically. Uh, as far as you had mis misnested elements, uh, they would each result in uh, different and somewhat incompatible DOMs. Uh, with the new HTML parser algorithm specified in the specification, uh, that is now being made much, much more consistent. Uh, so the, in theory, the error handling for all possible errors you can see is, uh, is now defined and hopefully all implementations will now implement that in exactly the same way. Uh, it does also mean that SVG and MathML can now be used directly inside HTML markup, whereas previously that was limited to using XHTML and explicit namespaces, uh, which of course is not supported by some uh, notable browsers. Uh, so with SVG and MathML in HTML now, uh, the, the need for XHTML itself is now somewhat reduced, and it also means you can embed those directly instead of using uh, an image element or an embed element to reference external SVG and MathML files. So uh, that's been uh, implemented in Firefox 4 and in a Opera Labs release which we released a month or two ago and also uh, in WebKit Nightly's and uh, it should be in uh, Safari and Chrome soon I believe. Okay so uh, thanks for listening I believe that was the last